Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for coming. And uh, um, I'm just very pleased to see my old friend and mentor Ralph Austin, who brought me to uh, Hyde Park here in 93. Um, and he introduced me to the place by saying that University of Chicago is the most intellectual place in the United States. And then he took me to the Red Lion Cafe, which was a kind of workshop where the Africanists from Chicago and Northwestern would meet. Uh, and there was a talk by some I don't, a recent postdoc who gave a very solid talk, and then the famous John Komarov didn't ask the first question, he made a comment, which has, as far as I could see, very little to do with the presentation, but then everyone else was talking about Komarov's intervention, and in the end the visitor was saying by saying, thank you for inspiring us to many interesting topics. Uh, so I just wanted to say that I'm fully prepared of uh, what is expecting me today, and uh, especially because my paper is not really fully fledged, but just uh, was kind of, of, of emerging from, from an article I wrote on the social question in Africa, but very much on the colonial period, and this is a kind of uh, sequence. Uh, but I start with a happy moment in African history, 1960, the uh, moment of uh, independence in most African countries. And in the decade after 1960, Africa and the minds of many people around the world um, went during a phase from becoming a, a continent of colonies to a continent of developing countries. And of course, the big uh, idea of, the, of, the, uh, of this phase was that producing more goods and services as measured by growing domestic product per capita, GDP, was both a sign and the substance of economic change, of more productive agriculture and industry, better integration to world markets, and the resources needed to bring a large majority of, uh, pop of the population out of poverty. But at the same time, a first generation of skeptics emerged that soon began to question the linkage of growth in terms of GDP with a deeper goal of development. Growth did not necessarily mean structural change, and its fruits might not be going to the majority of population. And these questions have returned then in the 2000s, as high growth rates, among the highest in the world, I mean, some of African countries, Ethiopia and Nigeria, had uh, one of the highest um, growth rates in the world at that time. So, so this kind of growth seemed to some observers to announce that Africa had recovered from the severe economic downturn of the 1980s and 90s and was back on the path of econ to economic success. Some of you might remember this famous cover of The Economist, The African Miracle, while well, 10 years before, the economist had this famous cover that, you know, Africa is a disaster. Um, so things changed very quickly. But of course, also the skeptics returned, uh, arguing that most of these gains were in the export of minerals, oil, copper, and gold among them, and did not imply that economies were diversified or more capable of improving the lives of poor people. Indeed, some feared a lock-in phenomenon that high export growth led to a concentration of capital and labor in sectors producing a very narrow range of goods that had little use domestic domestically, and that Africa was becoming all the more dependent on markets over which Africa ha Africans had no control. And it is no secret that, of course, uh, uh, there was one crucial player, if not the only, but, but not the only one behind this, and that was China and China's extraordinary boom. And the argument of the critics or skeptics was that this kind of, of China's uh, uh, um, economic boom drove the improved statistics for African economies. Three quarters of China's imports from Africa were in oil and minerals. And um, Chinese investments in Africa were similarly focused on energy, mineral, and transportation, as was foreign uh, in direct investment from other countries. You can see this is a huge dam project in Ethiopia. And of course, dams have been, in many ways, a kind of signifier of industrialization or the efforts to industrialization uh, in Africa since the 1950s, 60s. Most ended, I wouldn't say as a disaster, but were not that successful as uh, they 
uh, should have been. With some signs in the 2010s that the Chinese miracle was becoming less miraculous, prices and uh, prices of Africa's raw materials began to fall, and the future of growth became less sure. In the case of oil, uh, whose place in the Chinese-led boom was particularly large, tiny elites in countries such as Nigeria, Angola, Gambon, and Equatorial Guinea were pocketing most of the proceeds, doing little to bring about sustainable economic structures or alleviate the grinding power of the majority of the population and putting their country's budgets in jeopardy. Uh, and you can see that often, in, especially in African cities, you could see the kind of, uh, how should I say, harsh contrasts. This is, uh, these are pictures from Lagos. Uh, and you can see this kind of uh, hyper-modern building. And of course, Lagos has been celebrated by many as a kind of new, energetic, cultural place in Africa. But on the other hand, you had even increasing uh, poverty and misery uh, of parts of the urban uh, population. So while the percentage of Africans living in poverty has declined significantly in the harsh treatments of miners in the hand of Mangus, with grievances particularly, but not exclusively, focused on Chinese-owned minings. Uh, there's a very um, uh, good article by Shi Quan Li, a sociologist from UCLA, Raw Encounters, uh, in which she describes the kind of, of daily encounters between African workers uh, uh, and mine owners, uh, Chinese mine owners in Africa. Although one has to say that China, and I will come back to this briefly, mostly bring their own, or Chinese companies mostly bring their own uh, workers with them. So the next downswing, if it materializes, and we see many signs of it, will likely find workers even less, uh, of a, with even less of a cushion that they had in the 1970s when the first big crisis emerged. And then there are, of course, oil-producing states, which in some ways became even the caricatures of state-centered development. 
Africa came somewhat late to the world of oil, discovered uh, in uh, southeastern Nigeria uh, in the 1950s, and then coming into production in the 1960s. Now Angola, Gabon, um, Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon and Sudan are major producers. Recent discoveries in um, a number of other parts of coastal West Africa uh, are adding to this. But all producers could be described as spigot economies. They require large investment from multinational companies and highly skilled labor to develop the wells and open the tapes. And then a small number of workers, mostly uh, uh, expatriates, manage the world. So the government then collect vast uh, rents. Uh, and oil production thus differs quite considerably from the mining of copper, of copper gold, uh, and other minerals, in that it involves far fewer workers and has fewer links to regional economies. So oil production, in a way, represents the extreme of an economic situation in which the crucial relationship is that between a state that asserts so uh, sovereign control of a resource and for foreign corporations that have the capacity to exploit it. Uh, but oil is probably the extreme but also very telling example of the fact that all these growth rates did not correspond at all with any raise in more available jobs. So while you have all these fantastic growth rates, the number of workplaces uh, didn't change at all. Of course, the revenue could have, could have been used to diversify productive resources, but it was more likely used to enrich an elite that collects the rent and for symbolically important project as oil fed governments build roads, uh, governments build roads and schools in the home villages of leading members of the government. And in Nigeria, uh, another flip side of the oil boom was that it nearly ruined cocoa. And cocoa was a product which had the virtue of involving thousands and thousands of Nigerians in production and marketing. So over time, Nigeria became even more dependent, not less, on exporting its oil for government revenue and foreign exchange. So for most of Africa, the harsh times of the 1980s and 1990s had wider effect than those felt by, elite, by an elite of wage workers deteriorating health services in cities and countryside, higher fees for the education of children, unreliable electricity and water supplies, and very few social services provided by government. The export boom of the, of the 2000s led, has led to extremes, and one of the extremes is this city. I don't know if someone of you recognize it. Little sketch. No, it, it's Luanda, uh, the capital of Angola, which is now one of the most expensive cities in the world, with high-end accommodation focused on foreigners in the oil and related industries and the Angolan elite. And uh, while miserable conditions in the surrounding slums are mitigated mainly by relations of clientage with members of the ruling political party. And part of this Angolan system has been now kind of uh, set out in the media because of the president's daughter who was involved in one or a few more uh, slightly dirty businesses. Um, of course, such conditions do not necessarily encourage investment in a broad range of economic activities, but in rather narrowly focused, often high cost services, including private security, that's of course uh, a branch that is booming, and private electric generation for elite enclaves. enclaves. Chinese corporations interested in investing in Africa have sometimes built their own infrastructure, including railroads, but often brought their own workforce. And in any case, these Chinese investments represent a far cry from the multifaceted networks of communication and inter-business links that drive development elsewhere. Around 1960, when most African former colonies gained independence, things looked far, looked far more positive. At that time, Numerous observers thought that with population growth having accelerated after 1945 and with an urban population growing faster than the rural, a class of landless manual workers would be created and Africa would reproduce European patterns. There was the assumption that Africa was becoming proletarianized, its working class was growing and becoming better defined and more self-conscious. 
And indeed, um, we sometimes then tended to forget because of the crisis, the later crisis. But from the late 1950s on to the 1970s, many African countries experienced at least modest economic growth, life expectancy rose considerably, and education became more accessible. The emergence of elements of a welfare state raised considerable expectations. State employees, workers in copper mines or railwaymen, for instance, had reasonable hopes that they could get something out of participation in economic activities. But these decades, in which respect, proved not to be uh, to be not a midpoint in a kind of natural transition from non-wage labor to a wage labor economy in a welfare state. While it is difficult to count precisely, it is clear that the number of hired workers in sub-Saharan Africa was vastly greater in 1960 than it was in 1900. It is much greater today than it was around the time of independence. Yet labor markets since the end of colonial rule are characterized much more by short-term hiring and high turnover of workers than by long-term stable employment. Precarious labor prevailed both in the formal and the informal sector. So the number of people who fit the category of the wage worker in post-colonial Africa did not grow as expected, while it was the category of the excluded, variously known as customary labor, informal labor, and precarious labor that grew. So the aspirations of millions of Africans, which had seemed reasonable for turning jobs, especially unionized stable jobs, with pension funds promised at the end, into a career proved unreliable. The mining sector in um, yeah. the mining sector, for instance, in um, in, in the Zambian copper belt, uh, initially promised steady material rewards as measured by salary and health and retirement benefits, as well as other more ineffable returns in terms of cultural cachet and social status. Um, and this is very nicely, and nicely is probably the wrong word, but very, very intensely described by Jim Ferguson's book, Expectations of Modernity, which describes this kind of high hopes uh, and then the disaster uh, and frustrations that follow. So that pathway to working class stability and respectability soon came to an end with the oil crisis, structural adjustment programs, and fluctuating global copper prices. What meager resources these miners kept for their old age came not so much from uh, the formal institutions of modern welfare capitalism, social security, pensions, medical insurance, or the contractual gains won by the trade unions, but sets of personal relationships that ex-miners could draw on or forge. Pity trade, access to farmland through social relations in the village of origin, or support of kin networks became necessary to survive in the context of a contracting regulated wage labor sector. The big man notion of self-esteem that had been given a new dimension by wage earning increasingly confronted the fact that women engaged in urban marketing and other activities were contributing more to the family economy and providing that stability that male wages could not or could not do anymore. The bu bureaucratized work of world, world of work had not eclipsing the world of social relations, so to speak. If it had done so, the collapse would have been even more deadly than it was anyway. So young men whose social power long rested on the ability to earn wages increasingly find themselves in a more precarious position. In turn, others, notably women, but also elderly people, pensioners, acquired new powers and possibilities. And this uh, transformation is at least partly due to the relative expansion of work in the service sector and service industries that are more open to women than the blue-collar industrial jobs of the past. And the increasing instability of economic prospects in many African countries today has also changed migration patterns. So, of course, there's this classic, I mean, since colonial period, this classic seasonal uh, uh, labor migration, very central to many African economies in the first half of the 20th century. This has been overtaken by more permanent rural urban migration. So people continue to, uh, to uh, keep coming to the cities, living off irregular employment, small-scale marketing, or more successful family members. 
Seeking an urban job did not reflect so much a careful calculation of rural and urban alternatives as a logic akin to gambling. The hope that persistent family networks or finding a patron would produce a big leap out of the poverty trap. And at least this is my uh, experience with gambling. Failure was more likely than success. And uh, this was also the case here very often. So one consequence has been for job seekers to look further afield, especially to Europe. The former citizens of French Africa had the right under the treaties that gave uh, their countries independence to seek work and reside in France until French policy changed in the mid-1970s. Britain was also relatively open to immigration uh, into the 1960s. And even since then, immigration has continued ever since through clandestine routes and otherwise. In the 2000s, attempts of young, largely male Africans to reach Europe although much less than migration within Africa, that's always important to, to emphasize, became, as you all know, a drama. Some Europeans were shocked by the tragedy of thousands of people drowning as they tried to reach the Canary Islands, Sicily, and southern Spain in overcrowded, unsafe boats under the thumb of scrupulous human traffickers. Others propagated racialized images of hordes of Africans invading Europe. And if you Look, I mean, one of the more successful and most discussed books of the last years has been by a former Le Mans journalist, uh, Stephen Smith, who very much uh, painted this picture uh, uh, of Africans overrunning Europe. And he was uh, kind of diagnosing that in 2050, I think one third of uh, the European population would have some, will have some roots in Africa. By the way, the favorite book of Emmanuel Macron, but uh, I mean, at least he said so. Uh, uh, but, but this kind, even in, in, in the kind of presenting as a scientific uh, uh, outcome, although most demographers immediately said this is complete bullshit, uh, but still this kind of, of image is very much around. Uh, and it's interesting, just another point um, around this refugees. Uh, in 2015, of course, in many parts of Europe, Germany among them, there was much talk about the so-called refugee crisis. But during that year, there were even more immigrants coming from Zimbabwe to South Africa than coming from all other parts of the world to Western Europe. So also the power to make news uh, and, and, and really to, to determine what a refugee crisis is about uh, is very important. In Africa, the migratory wave has other meanings. It has a great deal to do with family solidarity, with the support that a migrant who made it to Europe or North America could give to relatives back home. And it was also a reflection of the acutest juncture in the world economy that induced young men to look beyond the continent to support themselves and their families. And this is a kind of, of typical uh, uh, picture from southern Europe that is, um, uh, I think, what kind of fruits they are, whatever, uh, picky, this is in, in southern Italy. Uh, so of course this is one of the, the uh, occupations, because this kind of work nobody else in Italy or in Spain or so ever wants to do, so that is where uh, uh, they find uh, uh, jobs. And although the largest number of would-be workers were and remained poor and unskilled, especially in impoverished and conflict-ridden regions, skilled and highly educated Africans have also sought jobs elsewhere, where sophisticated industries and professional opportunities, including for engineers and doctors, could provide possibilities commensurate with their talent and training. The result of the presence in Europe and North America of large numbers of Africans, from street cleaners to professionals, has been a high volume of remittances sent back to Africa. There's again a huge debate about the exact figures uh, and um, some even argue that uh, the remittances uh, now exceed the level of foreign aid. In any case, what we know is that in some countries, the dependence on remittances is strikingly high. Uh, these are numbers from the 2000s, early 2000s. So Liberia gets roughly 25% of its GDP from remittances. Lesotho, 17%. Senegal 10%, but in some arid areas near the Senegal River, remittances make up 
depending a bit, uh, to 20 to 50 percent of family budgets. But remittances are also in factor, a factor in migration within Africa as migrants stream from Zimbabwe to South Africa, from Burkina Faso to Cote d'Ivoire. Within South Africa, the dependence of rural women on the insecure urban earnings of men started very early with a kind of early uh, uh, um, uh, migrant labor, then worsened very much in the 1950s and again in the 1970s as expulsions of, uh, of women from cities under apartheid regulations exacerbated the pressure on land. Such areas were no longer seen as resources for the social reproduction of the workforce, they were more or less dumping grounds. And even after the end of apartheid, it has been hard for people caught between rural areas with exhausted soil and too dense population and urban slums where, John, where job opportunities are lacking. So I think it's important to see this kind of migrations at a variety of levels, and at least in much of the media, it's still this kind of labor migration coming to Europe or to the United States. And this migration within and beyond Africa appears to so many to be the only path out of poverty and this points to the profound consequences of inequality both among and within states. And China and parts of Southeast Asia provide examples of improved incomes in recent decades, but overall the hopes expressed in the 1960s that political liberation would allow the poor countries of the world to level themselves upward have only in part been met and assertions of economists in the 1980s and 1990s that market-oriented policies would lead to economic opportunities in Africa have not been realized. So, I mean, many Africans still uh, are waiting for the wonders um, or the miracles uh, of the market. Instead, the convergence upward, um, economists have observed widening gaps between first and third worlds, if you like, within each of these worlds, within African countries. So the connectedness of different regions continues in spite of obstacles to immigration in Europe and North America, the vulnerabilities of illegal migrants to exploitative employers, and the loss of earning potential of migrant workers whenever there was a recession in the industrial economy. So this kind of, of migration or connectedness continues despite increasing obstacles. And much of development policy, for instance, in Germany, is now directed to keep Africans in Africa. So there's a very clear kind of direction to, to cut uh, uh, these, these connections uh, uh, if possible. Back to the 1970s. In the 1970s, in the early 1970s, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, began to use the evocative but sloppy term urban and former sector for the urban dimension of what did not fit inside national labor legislations, and a bounded, stabilized working class. Uh, so for this, uh, trying to describe what was going on beyond this, and there was a lot going on, uh, they used the term urban informal work. And this term pointed to the continued, indeed growing, importance of forms of work that lay outside um, the limits of the imagination of policymakers who thought they were modernizing Africa. Well, this is a kind of typical picture where people think this is informal. Uh, and, and Jan Bremen, the sociologist and Dutch sociologist of India, very early said, my gosh, I mean, this, this term is impossible. Because, I mean, if you just try to conceptualize people who are selling something on the streets, uh, this is not really enough. And it's not new anyway. Uh, but uh, the term somehow won. Um, and although some African, and this is, of course, here, yeah, so this is the institution which very much popularized uh, uh, the term, the, the ILO and its headquarters in, in, in Geneva. And although Africanists insist that African economies are the most informalized in the world, at least something Africa is leading, non-wage economic activities unregulated by law and unprotected by social regulations and services have become increasingly visible in many parts of the world of course, increasingly also in the North Atlantic region. And the discovery of the informal, slowly but surely, went in pair with the observation that full wage time wage labor with relatively good social benefits over the course of an entire career was not a global norm, but rather the exception in many parts 
of the world, even the exception in many parts uh, of the North Atlantic world. So in many ways, as uh, uh, Marcel van der Linden and, and other uh, protagonists of global labor history argue, the contingent product of a particular conjuncture in 20th century world history. The, and there are many problems with the concept of, of informal, and especially with the urban informal sector, because the urban informal sector wasn't specifically urban, first of all. It wasn't really informal, since relations among producers were quite complex and often highly organized. And it wasn't a sector, really, uh, for economic activities of different sorts overlapped each other. To the extent that there was something specific about its operations, it was defined negatively and not by economic role or structure, but by state regulation, or rather the absence thereof. That something other than contractually bound, state-regulated forms of work were becoming increasingly salient, although they are found in many time periods and many places, was apparently an important subject for inquiry. The conceptual tools to analyze such forms and all the specificity were harder to pinpoint. What were the relationships between, uh, of the big men to the varied categories of market sellers, street vendors, art artisanal apprentices, beggars, and small-scale economic enterprises over whom they exercised different degrees of control? Did these vulnerable workers constitute a sort of reserve army of the underemployed, available to serve the wealthy, government officials acting beyond their state roles, or even people with only slightly better resources than, than uh, those they possessed? What were the interfaces between such entrepreneur and state actors, or perhaps to state actors who privatized economic activity to themselves? There was, in fact, a great deal, a very important uh, deal of work, empirical work in the 1980s and 1990s, addressing such questions for Africa and beyond. But whether finding an overall la label for such complex processes helped or hindered the endeavor is difficult to say, or at least not so clear. At least the critical literature seems to agree on the in inadequ inadequacy of the term informal, but has failed to produce alternative terminology. I mean, that's, that's a very familiar thing. It's much nicer, much more fun to deconstruct terms than to really uh, uh, provide uh, a useful uh, alternative. And I mean, in our field, we have many concept cops, but. Uh, in terms of, of, of creating concepts, uh, that's much more difficult. Um, I would at least argue for an understanding of informal labor not as a residue of earlier and obsolete modes of socially organizing labor, because this is still part of the, this is something from the past which someone has survived because they are not really modern yet. I think informal should be understood as a contemporary and adaptable social political category that distinguishes a heterogeneous and unstable set of transformed and new informal in the main socially regulated labor forms from an equally diverse and malleable set of formal, predominantly state regulated labor forms. That was a good example of how Germans construct their phrases, very long <laughs> and very complex. Um, so these two sets of labor forms are mutually constitutive, interdependent, and assume diverse features and proportions in the course of historical time, as well as in different local and territorial contexts. And the social content and the interrelationship of informal and formal labor is shaped and persistently transformed by economic and social policies, business strategies, and social conflicts. Accordingly, the politics of informal labor are often connected to efforts at the resolution of crises of capitalist overaccumulation, including efforts to solve such crises by way of spatial expansion and relocation. I think it is crucial to emphasize that the, the political character of formal informal divisions in the contemporary world of labor across the continents, as well as to reconstruct the historical genesis of this device, and some, of course, working on that. I think it's not by accident, of course, that the academic, that as an academic and political concept, informal labor gained gain currency in the course of the 1970s, 
the middle of that decade being a crucial chronological marker for a major shift in the patterns of economic and social policies, business strategies and social conflict the world over. And of course the 70s have become now a very uh, uh, important period uh, of historical um, uh, interpretations. And of course, I mean, it's always the turning point thing is always difficult because there are so many things that didn't turn. But still, again, I mean, I think in some ways one can say that the 70s are a crucial marker, especially for Africa, the oil crisis, more than two other continents, played uh, a very important role. So, in fact, the, the career of the term informal sector may be linked to the rise of the political and ideological formation that is commonly referred to as neoliberalism, although I don't uh, like the terms and I share this kind of uneasiness uh, with many others, I think. Again, this, thus it would be important um, to study more carefully the political and social processes that had rendered the informal formal division conceivable. And finally, it's also important to see that many activities labeled as informal are not relatively new and exclusively spawned, spawned uh, by neoliberal reforms and structural adjustment programs of the 1980s. Because uh, such assertions would overlook the deep roots of African productive systems and the relationships that contemporary skilled workers and craftsmen share with older services and forms of fabrications. So, I mean, there have been some studies on brickmakers and others who really show the kind of continuity and then also the fact that suddenly these activities are labeled informal, uh, I think is something to, to, to think about. So in, in any case, it's, it, it's very crucial to, to locate uh, uh, informal activities or what we may define as informal activities within larger trajectories of historical change. And while the term informal might be problematic and not sufficiently differentiated as an analytic tool, it refers nevertheless to crucial processes uh, in the social question in Africa. When the world economic recession of the 1970s hit Africa hard, most governments were forced to seek aid from the International Monetary Fund and other international institutions, which in turn enforced the destruction of much that could be considered social. The right to education, medical care, a livable wage was undermined in the name of financial rigor. Cutbacks in the public sector and social programs eroded the number of waged employees. Households were forced to diversify their sources of income and informal activities increasingly suffered from the uncertain jurid uh, juridical status and the volatility, uh, um, vo volat volatility? volatility of their finances. Small scale workshops were often characterized by low surplus and strong competition and usually not more than severely undercapitalized and unskilled businesses. Market women particularly suffered as they were faced with f uh, uh, falling incomes of poor and working class customers and more and more had to compete with men engaged as street vendors after losing their wage jobs. What also could be observed, uh, increasingly observed, was dividing a given activity in ever finer, finer morsels, as James Ferguson put it. That is, a young man who in the 1970s would have sold tiny packets of peanuts in the streets of Dakar, or in the 2000s low-denomination phone top-up cards, finds a niche because his labor, is his labor is worth so little that an entrepreneur can employ him to sell things to people too poor to uh, spend a significant sum of money at a time. So this reality on the ground stands in stark contrast to celebratory statements of the World Bank and some NGOs highlighting the energy and skill of the small-scale entrepreneur. And there's a bitter irony, in fact, that empowerment through informal enterprise, so sheerish by neoliberal commentators, was undermined by neoliberal politics that drastically weakened the very institutions such as family, education, and basic safety nets upon which informal entrepreneurship is largely based. Precarity has become the other fashionable con new concept in labor studies. It seems to mark a transition from a period when capital was striving, just to see that I'm not talking too much, uh, striving to ensure that it could extract surplus value from a large and growing and potentially dangerous workforce to a situation in which more and more workers have become 
unnecessary, disposable. But the term has also been criticized precisely because precarity is, in the eyes of many analysts, an inherent characteristic of capitalist labor rather than of a particular phase of economic history. It is, as I said earlier, relative job security and relatively good social benefits that are unusual in capitalist economies, and they are the contingent project of a particular conjuncture of 20th century world history. The social arrangements that are now under fire as a conjuncture are now under fire as this conjuncture has evidently passed. And if critics of the current state of things invoke the dangers of precarity, the opposite side refers to capitalist economies' needs for flexibility. As Jan Bremen and Marcel Linden argue in a remarkable article on the return of the social question, the, protection, the protections afforded workers in Europe and to a sufficiently less extent in the United States, are a product of speci special, cir special circumstances of the 20th century, not least the power and potential threat of labor movements, fear of socialism or the socialist alternative, the rise of mass consumption, and attempts by elite, especially in democratic societies, to build cross-class coalitions and foster something like the French uh, uh, are fond of calling solidarity. They make clear, I mean, Bremen and, and, and van der Linden, that this model is under threat, that more and more labor contracts are short-term, that benefits, benefits are called into question in the name of austerity and flexible labor markets. But they are careful to point out that the gains of social demo de democracy are strongly defended, and it is not clear that the cause is lost. Even extreme right-wing movements often defend the welfare state, but their goal, of course, is to confine its benefits to a narrowly, often racially defined citizenry. Arguments, also uh, kind of, of, of made popular uh, in Chicago, in a certain department here, that the South is the future of the North, substitute in many ways teleology for political analysis. And these uh, ideas that Africa, in a way, is the future, represents the future of capitalism because all the nasty things you can already find there, which then will automatically more or less come uh, to the North Atlantic realm, uh, sounds smart, but if you think about it, and, and one, one, one factor that is not part of this picture uh, is one of the biggest actors in the world labor scene and uh, sometimes held responsible for the degradation of working condition in manufacturing elsewhere, um, and that is China. Uh, and of course, in such context, much is made of the low wages uh, of Chinese workers, but not of the fact that the rise in the standard of living and the reduction of poverty in China are almost unprecedented in world history, albeit at a high cost. I see my friend Jakob, who is a Chinese expert, so I'm very cautious. Uh, but at least he was, uh, okay, that's, that's good, thank you. Um, and wages have been going up in China too enough so that Chinese industries are sometimes moving to other countries, including to Africa, in search of cheaper, la cheaper labor. So we need to keep in mind uh, that partly successful struggles of labor movements supported by the political movements of the day for minimum wages, for family allowances, pensions, the right to unionize and to strike. Uh, I think this is important to see that there's no kind of automatic thing, but of course these labor struggles uh, are crucial. And in much history, of uh, recent labor history or more history of the work, these struggles somehow disappeared uh, from the picture. And I think it is important uh, uh, to bring them in. I still have so much to say, but running out of time. Uh, so um, I just quickly wanted, I mean, this is uh, um, Berlin. Uh, uh, so you can see that precarity has uh, reached uh, uh, many places. Uh, these are uh, Zimbabwean workers protesting uh, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in South Africa uh, uh, for better political living conditions. So there are uh, struggles going on, not probably in, in many parts of the world, probably not the kind of classic strike movements, but l laboring people uh, uh, continue to fight for their rights. Many of these news hardly reach us, but I think it's important uh, to keep in mind. Um, 
The prejudices that many elites, European and African, have these days in regard to precarious workers bear a resemblance to those held about Africans in general 80 years ago. They are accused of not having a culture that is amenable to work or to life in the so-called modern world. The problem in such a conception isn't the nature of work in today's capitalist economy, but the inadaptability of certain people to work. Such arguments have powerful backing within international financial organizations, but also in some African governments. The ILO felt compelled to name a new program at the end of the 1990s, the Decent Work Agenda. In effect, an admission that much work was not decent. The notion implies, and I quote, opportunities for work that is productive and delivers a fair income, security in the workplace, and social protection for families, better prospects for personal development and social integration, freedom for people to express their concerns, organize and participate in the decisions that affect their lives and equality of opportunity and treatment for all women and men. Implicit in the program's definition is that forms of labor widely practiced today in Africa and elsewhere deprive people of dignity and security. But whether the ILO has any plausible remedies for the situation is very much in question. And I quickly conclude. So um, I wanted or, or one of the broader uh, points um, I try to make in the broader project is that African independent states inherited a complex and potentially explosive combination of authoritarian governance, high expectations for improved living condition, a limited extent of formal employment and already fragmented trade unions. Thus, even before the devastating impact of the oil crisis, followed by structural adjustment programs, wage labor was never available as a foundation of an egalitarian and democratic society. Labor coercion and personal dependence did not disappear, often facilitated by poverty at all levels. The colonial discourse of development that began in the 1930s and continued after independence labeled work that otherwise could have been classified as forced labor, as voluntary work, self-help, or human investment. In this process, certain sections of African labor were rendered invisible as workers and instead constructed as beneficiaries, participants, or volunteers. The issue of forced labor continued to be debated after independence. In 1962, the ILO Committee of Experts on the Application of Conventions and Recommendations criticized a number of recently independent African countries, such as Guinea and the Ivory Coast, for having set up new forms of forced labor in the form of compulsory labor services for young people. And the unfreedom, so to speak, never went away. It is diffused and can be found in many sectors or embedded in various labor relations. In 2016, the ILO estimated that there was a total of over 9.2 million victims of modern slavery in Africa. Uh, child labor is one of the highly uh, uh, contested, debated issues uh, in this context. The question is how to label all those Africans who by their own initiative across, uh, across the Mediterranean Sea to Italy or Spain or the Atlantic to the Canary Islands to seek wage labor. Those Africans who between the 16th and 19th centuries were sent across the Atlantic to work on slave plantations in the Americas were coerced and they were called slaves. Today's migrants, however, are in some ways the freest of the free. They not only agree to leave Africa for Europe, but they go to great effort and great risk to do so. So to, um, this again uh, is a very short comment, we can elaborate on this, on the free and unfree divide. I didn't say much about uh, the concept of free wage labor. Uh, uh, most of you know that already Marx had his doubts about what is free about free wage labor. And I think the, the question of freedom and unfreedom in labor and who is a free laborer in Africa is something to debate. So just to, to, to emphasize, it would be misleading, I think, to see informal and precarious work uh, 
only as a new phase in capitalism in which workers in many parts of the world, and most notably in Africa, have become un unnecessary disposable. I'm not sure if, this is, if it is good news, but uh, I think that multinational capital might still need many workers from Africa, as long as they are cheap, particularly to reach customers of modest, modest means. And moreover, I think, and the African example shows that, but I think this is something to be debated for many other parts of the world. Precarity could be seen as a constitutive feature of capitalist, capitalist labor in so much as uncertainty and instability have always been inherent characteristics of wage labor in Africa and elsewhere. Yet political mobiliz mobilizations of and collective bargaining for precarious and informal workers remain a challenge. And this is one of the big challenges that not only trade unions face today, who are desperately trying to think about new ways of, of, of organizing labor beyond their familiar way of, of, of only speaking to uh, uh, contract uh, wage laborers. Um, the temptation remains, this is my very last sentence, it's a long one, uh, <laughs> as it has in relation to so many domains in African studies, to treat forms of labor as a sign of the particularity of life in Africa. There are new abolitionist literatures today that publicize the problems of slavery now or child labor. And these are, of course, real issues. But the difficulty is to treat them as such without falling into the trap of thinking them about them as another peculiar feature of African culture. And of at least equal concern are the conditions facing real wage workers in much of Africa, the dismantling of social services in the era of structural adjustment, and the painful economic conditions that drive people to risk their lives in a small boat trying to get to Sicily or the Canary Islands. So in short terms, what we still need is to think about the terms on which Africa is connected to the rest of the world through labor, and there's still a lot of work to do. But not for me now, I stop. Thank you very much for listening.